All right, perfect. We're recording. Okay, perfect. We're recording. All right, so welcome, welcome. Um, we're going to start our first quarterly NABA Miami Blue uh, meeting of the year, 2022. And so uh, before we introduce our guest, um, let's start with an activity. That's really quick. All right, so um, we're going to talk about Monarchs today. But before we get into the details of Monarchs, uh, there are some populations that migrate from one location to another. Let me ask you, when they go to Mexico, do you actually know where they're going to overwinter? So here I have a map that uh, defines, I guess, the ecosystems that uh, occur in Mexico, but the monarchs that migrate the Eastern population go to a very specific spot. So, you, I guess you can turn on your mics. Tell me, where should I highlight? Should I highlight the brown? Should I highlight the green? Where do you think the monarchs overwinter? Where should I draw my circle? I think it's black. Well, who said, is that Bar Barbara? You're not allowed to I'm sorry, I shouldn't have been answered. I'm <laughs> sorry. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Can we get a non-barber person to participate? <laughs> or the top one. Up here, the brown? Yeah, the top one. No, black. I'm going with black. I'm going with black, black. Brown. What's black, brown. brown. All right. So uh, more specifically, uh, which of these types of forest, scrub, rainforest? So you say black. Are you referring to the, I yes. think it's all your male forest? Oh, yeah. So Melissa is correct. Yes. Uh, and so that would be these areas right here. Right. So if you want to go to Mexico City and see a lot of monarchs, like right here, these are all monarchs uh, on the Oyama first, you would go to this area right here. So that's where they overwinter. So this is a very important area to protect in Mexico. All right. Everybody was confused by the um, the key. I think everybody was looking at the green, thinking green represented forest. I just got lucky and looked over there at the key. <laughs> and and the answer was actually right here. So you just match that up with this. <laughs> All right. So these are the kind of things that I do to torture my students in class uh, <laughs> to make sure that they're engaged. All right. <laughs> All right. So. Um, before we start, I just want to let everybody know that if you're not a member, please yeah. consider being yeah. a member. All right. Oh, yeah. Second. Uh, by the way, can you um uh, turn your mics off? If you do want to speak to us, it's fine. Turn your mics on, but let's not keep the mic on the entire time because there's often a lot of background noise. So I'm going to mute some of you. But if you want to talk to us, turn your mic back on and we can talk. All right. So um, if you're not a member, uh, please consider being a member. I believe the membership is, uh, Linda Evans, can you tell us uh, how much is the membership? It's listed right. Uh, Linda, what, can you say it again? All right. So I believe if I look on the screen, it's about $35 a year. And along with being a member, um, you can participate in walks. So we often do butterfly surveys. And if you're into looking for some of the less common um, rare butterflies, you'll definitely see that with us when we go on the walks. And we actually have a lot of experts, um, whether the, the member is an officer or not, um, there are a lot of people who participate in these surveys and um, they're really good. They can look at like a brown skipper, for example, and say, oh, that's the Acola skipper, or that's the, give me some brown skipper name. Um, so you should definitely consider that. Um, also, you get access to the NABA butterfly magazines and newsletters and stuff too. So you can read up on what's going on in the butterfly world, uh, particularly in the United States. Um, so those are just some of the perks of being a NABA member. All right, I want to move this out of the way over here. So we know why everybody is here. You're here to see Dr. Daniels. 
and I prepared a slide to introduce him. However, Dennis, uh, our president, is going to introduce him. So without further ado. Uh, good All afternoon. Right. Uh, this is Dennis. <laughs> um, so it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Jarrett Daniels. We've known, many of us have known Jarrett for many years, uh, a very important person in the butterfly scene in Florida, in particular, uh, both in terms of the Shouse's Swallowtail and the Miami Blue. Um, Dr. Daniels has done extensive work in the restoration of those two species and the captive breeding in particular. Uh, he is the assist an assistant professor at University of Florida, and more importantly, for our purposes, the curator of the McGuire Center for the Lepidoptera and Biodiversity, which is part of the Florida Museum of Natural History. And again, Jared is a good friend of our organization. Uh, we've worked with him collaboratively on a number of projects, mostly related to those two species of butterflies that we just that I just mentioned. So, Jared, I'll turn it over to you and let you. Uh, uh, give your presentation. Thanks so much, Dennis. I really appreciate it. Um, and it's so nice to see so many familiar faces, uh, especially some folks who I haven't seen in person for a little while. So thank you all for what you do in keeping the South Florida butterfly community safe and sound. Your, your contributions are uh, very, very critical and important, especially at this particular time. So today I want to talk a little bit about um, monarchs in Florida, which is often a challenging and somewhat confusing uh, story. Uh, it seems like everything we talk about with Florida, there are unique exceptions to the rule, and that's uh, certainly the situation for today. So I'm going to introduce um, kind of the what is going on in Florida, and I'm going to then end by talking about some additional initiatives related to the monarch uh, that are going on in the state of Florida, and especially in my lab at the University of Florida, just to give you an update on, on how you might want to participate and just keep you updated on some of the initiatives that we're working on overall. So I think it comes as no surprise that we, we know that the monarch is essentially the most iconic and beloved insect in North America. It is exceedingly well known for a number of stories, uh, particularly the multi-generational annual migration, which arguably is one of the most natural, most spectacular natural phenomenon uh, on the planet um, with individuals traveling in excess of 3000 miles and historically up to a billion monarchs from the Eastern population overwintering in the mountains of Mexico uh, within the oil mill fir forest, as Jason pointed out earlier. So this is, you know, arguably just an amazing uh, event uh, to witness, but there are, of course, many other unique qualities that make the monarch kind of the gateway bug to the natural world. Um, it is a butterfly inherently of open habitats, um, fields, pastures, prairies, grasslands uh, in proximity to larval host plants. It's highly adaptable to urbanized settings, so it's a pretty much a ubiquitous butterfly where humans live and occupy. It's a very easy butterfly to attract, as you all know, to your home landscape. And during the migration, because thousands or millions of individuals are moving around the landscape, it can literally be found in virtually any habitat during that annual fall migration. So this makes it, again, a very um, reliable butterfly for the public to encounter. And I know you all know this, but just as a point of summary, I just want to talk a little bit about the three distinct populations within North America. So west of the Rocky Mountains, bounded to the east of by the Rockies themselves, is the smaller western population, which is migratory, but those individuals predominantly move uh, from inland locations to the coast of California. Some individuals do migrate down into the mountains of Mexico, but that's a very small percentage. Uh, and this is a population that, as you know, has been under ex excessive threat over the last uh, 30 years or so. And we'll talk a little bit about those numbers in just a bit. And then, of course, the eastern population, which is the largest and kind of most dominant migratory population 
uh, and the majority of those individuals go to Mexico to overwinter. Historically, over a billion individuals, more recently in the hundreds of millions, uh, moving southward or southwestward in the fall and making their way to only a few square miles of high elevation fir forest. And then um, within Florida, uh, especially South uh, Florida within Miami-Dade County, we have the only non-migratory population in North America, um, which is poorly studied and poorly known biologically. Um, and of course, during the fall migration, we do have individuals that funnel into peninsular Florida. Uh, some of course go through the peninsula and onto Cuba and Hispaniola. Some move around the Gulf Coast. Some may even move across the Gulf of Mexico to, um, to Mexico on that uh, kind of direct route as well. Uh, but we are still unraveling the mysteries of the migration in many ways. And of course, as you know, most of the recent attention has focused on the more serious decline of the monarch, especially over the last 25 to 30 years. And the Eastern population alone has declined over that kind of period of time by about 84% or more. Of course, recent numbers have ticked up just a little bit. And the Western population really garnered a lot of this attention because up until this past year where there now were a quarter of a million butterflies found in the overwintering populations along coastal California, the Western population declined to less than 1% of its historic size. So it's literally hovering on the brink of an extinction threshold in the West. And there's been a lot of attention on conservation actions to try to reverse these trends in the East and the West. And these, of course, were precipitated by a petition to list the monarch under the Endangered Species Act and similarly under uh, the, Canada, uh, the Canadian Species at Risk Act uh, as threatened or endangered. And this is still um, being considered by US Fish and Wildlife as a listing option. And while there are many drivers of this decline and we're still unraveling kind of the um, interconnectedness of these drivers or the uh, nuanced nature of some of these drivers, a, a great bulk of the literature clearly state or clearly come to the conclusion that loss of breeding habitat is a, a primary cause of this decline. And this should come as no surprise as we're losing land to human um, related uh, causes, whether it be agricultural intensification or urbanization, or, uh, as well as um, you know, increases in uh, insecticide use, agricultural chemical use. Uh, but there are of course many other drivers, including climate change, uh, other forms of pollution, habitat fragmentation, invasive species, all of these which are affecting not only the monarch, of course, but all sorts of other uh, insect populations. But loss of breeding habitat is, is arguably one of the, the leading drivers of this decline. And as I mentioned, there is a little bit of positive evidence over the last few years that the numbers are recorded both in the overwintering colonies as well as in the overwintering colonies uh, along coastal California, that those numbers have ticked up, but there is, um, there's a lot of um, uh, caution in how we actually analyze those individual data points. So you can see by this uh, graph uh, that is uh, based on the monarch watch numbers in the overwinning colonies in Mexico, that there's a lot of volatility from year to year that happens naturally within the population, a lot of up and down. Uh, and you'll see a, a really high peak back in 1996-97, where over a billion monarchs were recorded in the overrunning colonies. But since that time, the numbers have steadily ticked downward. And that's a, a big concern amongst conservation biologists, obviously, because if you extend that trend line down or the trend continues to decline, there's a point at which, while the monarch will not go extinct, the phenomenon that we know of as the annual fall migration uh, will become at least less um, robust and could potentially actually disappear. So at the far end of the graph on the right-hand side, you'll see those numbers ticking up just a little bit over the last several years. And a lot of folks are attributing kind of large-scale conservation efforts for turning around this decline. But there is uh, good evidence uh, based in the literature that uh, we still have a very long way to go to rebuild those populations, that these might be short-term gains 
uh, but we cannot pat ourselves on the back at the moment. We have to continue the trend of uh, being very vigil with our conservation efforts if we're gonna turn this population decline around because we have a long way to go to get back to historic numbers. And there's also a lot of attention focused on the monarch from a research point of view, as, as you all know, but I, I do really love this quote. Uh, and this was part of a, um, a dedicated um, issue in Frontiers in Ecology and Evolution. Um, and this quote, particularly uh, by Cheryl Schultz, uh, I think exemplifies the fact that we, we know very little about most insects and even the monarch being one of the most globally well-studied organisms there are still many mysteries that we, we don't yet know about the population dynamics, the broad scale, broad scale conservation efforts and its effect on the population and the human dimensions uh, that affect the monarch butterfly. So it may be one of the most well-studied organisms, but there's still a huge range of gaps of understanding that we need to fill in to have a much better uh, idea of how we are affecting this butterfly positively and negatively. Um, so that brings us to Florida and kind of the idiosyncrasies of the monarchs within the Deep South and the Florida Peninsula and Panhandle. So we all know that in the fall of the year that we have this massive Eastern migration heading southward. Um, bulk of those individuals go to Mexico, as I mentioned earlier, some do funnel into Peninsular Florida, um, and they, as they progress southward into peninsula, some will fall out of migration and breed. Others will continue onward, uh, presumably, and go on to Cuba and Hispaniola. Uh, some may, as I mentioned, cross uh, the Gulf of Mexico to the Yucatan Peninsula. Others move around the panhandle of Florida on their way to uh, the high elevation fir forest of Mexico. So it's a, it's a very dynamic system within Florida. And so arguably there are three types of monarchs that would occur in Florida. One of course is the non-migratory resident population in extreme South Florida. And again, as I mentioned, this is really woefully understudied. The amount of what we know about this population uh, is, is quite limited. There of course is the migratory population, which again, once those individuals hit Florida, we really don't have a lot of good data about what happens. There's, there's very limited uh, tag recovery within Florida uh, and things just kind of behave a little bit differently uh, within the Florida Peninsula. And then increasingly we have winter breeding of monarchs um, that is an artifact of both climate change, warming temperatures obviously, and also the proliferation of tropical milkweed. And this is again, something we, we know somewhat about, but there are still many gaps of understanding about what those monarchs are actually doing within Florida. Could there actually be true overwintering in Florida? Are these just opportunistically breeding? What is actually going on and how rapid are these kind of trends unfolding due to the drivers such as climate change and the proliferation of invasive or non-native species? So this is sort of the, the current state of knowledge of understanding the different types of monarch butterflies within Florida. And if you go a little bit deeper into this within the non-migratory population, again, a woefully understudied uh, population. And in fact, the US Fish and Wildlife Service, when they were making their listing decisions, had a really hard time understanding how to incorporate the non-migratory population within their analysis, just because there was such a dearth of information available on it. So there has been a little bit of study, obviously, um, and this is one that originated out of the University of Florida and Marta Wayne's lab uh, in the Department of Biology at UF. And they use stable isotopes to uh, understand the origin of the butterflies coming into peninsular Florida. And so stable isotopes can be used based on the signature of the milkweeds themselves that the larvae were feeding on. And so they, the adult butterflies can be sampled and you can understand what geographic region those monarch butterflies were coming from. And what they found is that about 48% of the monarchs collected in South Florida are indeed migrants that or originated outside of the sampling region of peninsular Florida. Uh, a good portion of these, when they got to South Florida, they did fall out of migration and breed. Some also did interbreed 
with the non-migratory population in South Florida. So it becomes very convoluted. There are some morphological differences between migrants and non-migratory uh, individuals in South Florida because migrants have uh, larger forewing lengths to enable them to be able to fly further distances. So there is a way, at least morphologically, of teasing apart potentially some of the differences uh, of resident population individuals and those that are migrants. But there, there is also this kind of switching from migratory behavior to resident behavior in South Florida. So um, if you're thinking that this is convoluted at best, you'd be spot on. This is, this is just the tip of the iceberg of understanding what actually is going on in South Florida. So much more research needs to be done to more fully understand uh, this dynamic in South Florida and whether this is changing uh, rapidly over the last several years due to uh, increasing climate change as well. There also is a lot of uh, data from citizen science, uh, scientist networks, whether it be Monarch Watch, Journey North, about both adult sightings uh, during the winter months in Florida and also breeding sightings uh, in Florida. So we, we do know that uh, there is an increasing proliferation of uh, immature and adult sightings during the winter months in Florida and really from uh, coastal North Carolina all the way to Austin, Texas. And this is growing rapidly year by year, again, presumably due to warming climate, but also the proliferation of non-native milkweed. So this would not be the historic ancestral state uh, of the monarch. Historically, monarch butterflies moving southward in the fall uh, would encounter environments that are less, much less conducive to continuous breeding than they are currently uh, within uh, 2022. So this is a dynamic that is changing year to year and you could argue not in the best favor for the monarch butterfly moving forward. And there was a really elegant study out of Sonia Altizer's lab at the University of Georgia. And you may know Sonia, uh, Sonia's lab because she's the one that runs the Monarch Health uh, and the OE monitoring uh, across North America. Uh, she's a fantastic scientist and she had a, a really great study that uh, compared or, or did a number of assays uh, looking at adult monarchs that were migratory and exposing them both to tropical milkweed as well as to a native milkweed, Asclepius uh, uh, incarnata, during the migration of the, uh, of the monarch, the fall migration. And what she found is that those individuals that encountered tropical milkweed, great majority of them fell out of migration and fell out of reproductive diapause, started oogenesis and spermogenesis, and became reproductively active, active again, and actually laid eggs on tropical milkweed. And this was much higher than those individuals that encountered a native milkweed during that same time period. So this provides the first real evidence that direct exposure to tropical milkweed can increase monarch reproductive activity, which ultimately will promote residency in year-round breeding and can ultimately disrupt the migration uh, during the fall months in the year. And, and this should come as really no surprise, I think, to all of us that have uh, seen the uh, extensive use of tropical milkweed in the deep south. And there's also some uh, challenges here with tropical milkweed because we know that the cardenolide concentrations within each milkweed vary significantly from one another. If you look at the graph on the far right-hand side of this slide, you see that Asclepius curasavica has some of the highest concentrations of cardenolides compared to other common milkweed species that monarch butterflies might encounter. And in Florida, uh, common milkweeds like Asclepius humistrata, pine woods milkweed, or in the Midwest, Asclepius syriaca, uh, common milkweed are much lower in concentration than Asclepius curasavica. We know that this varies across species. We know it varies also within species. And there's strong evidence that the herbivory caused by monarch larvae or other uh, plant pests cause this to be an inducible plant defense, meaning that uh, these concentrations increase with plant herbivory. And these tissue concentrations also decrease with plant age. And there was some recent studies, uh, a recent study that came out in 2021 that showed that uh, monarch overposition on Asclepius curasavica was greatest 
at the intermediate cardenolide concentrations of the plants that because of the natural variation across uh, the intraspecies uh, of the intraspecies variation, that there were some concentrations that were quite costly to the monarch to overcome. So there is a sweet spot, if you will, of that cardenolide concentration, which really kind of limits some of the, the trade-off benefits and the cost of sequestration for those monarch larvae. So uh, some plants can be quite uh, toxic even to the monarchs themselves or present a cost that is just not worth it for the monarchs to address. And then we also know an increasing amount about uh, the monarch population itself, uh, in large part in thanks to Lincoln Brower. So Lincoln Brower um, unfortunately passed away several years ago and Lincoln uh, was kind of the godfather of uh, monarch study within North America. I know just a wonderful researcher and a wonderful individual. And he started about 30 years ago, uh, the still ongoing longest term uh, annual um, survey or continuous research project dealing with the monarch butterflies in Florida. Uh, and this was something that was inherited by my lab and continues today. Uh, but he started this again 30 years ago. And based on this study, which takes place annually outside of Cross Creek, Florida, uh, we know that the monarchs coming back into Florida in the springtime from late February through April are those individuals dominantly coming from Mexico, not from coastal portions of Florida or other portions of the Deep South, but are actually originating from the mountains of, of central Mexico, predominantly because of their cardenolite signature. The majority of these individuals have a common milk, milkweed signature and Asclepias syriaca signature that are coming into Florida uh, early in spring to recolonize the Deep South each year. And we also know from deep study at this particular site a lot about the plant phenology and which milkweeds early in the year are most important. And of course, this plant, which many of you in South Florida don't commonly see, but if you go further north into Central and North Florida and along the Atlantic coastal plain of the Deep South, we'll find quite commonly, this is Asclepias humestrata or pine woods milkweed. And this is arguably the most important milkweed to the recolonization or the remigration of the monarch into uh, the Deep South each year because it's vegetative early in the year uh, and is uh, available then vegetatively to be utilized by the monarch uh, early in the year when many other milkweeds are not yet above ground. And what we found with this long-term study is that majority of the plants are available uh, for the monarchs to utilize from about early March up until early May when they start uh, really um, setting up seed pods and the dispersion of, dispersal of the seeds starts to happen. And uh, the main sweet spot for when monarchs are really utilizing these and when they're blooming and readily available is pretty much the first three weeks of April when they start really recolonizing much of um, North Central Florida each year. And we also know that kind of peaks of um, adults present kind of mirror that trend. They start coming in in earnest in mid-March and kind of peak by early May uh, of each year. And we found that these numbers over the past 30 years really have not changed much, which was really a surprise uh, owing to climate change, but these numbers held remarkably steady over the past 30 years. However, the news is not all good. And this uh, trend line kind of mirrors that Monarch Watch graph that over essentially the same timeline from about 1994 to present day, uh, monarch butterflies in Florida have uh, kind of seen about an 80%, 80 to 82% decline over that third year, 30 year period. So this is good evidence that the monarch population in Florida is being hit by the same drivers uh, and is reflecting those sort of more um, extensive North American trends of decline across Eastern portions of the US. And so that, uh, really showed that a, a, a decent 80% decline. And this included both adults as well as a number of eggs being laid on these plants. Um, and it's, it's really reasonable to hypothesize that um, these declines are, are owed to the same reasons 
that the overwintering populations are declining, presumably loss of breeding habitat. Um, and this is a, a study that's ongoing uh, with my lab and will be continued for the foreseeable future. So this is an abundance of data which we're just getting into and hopefully we'll be able to uh, kind of delve into additional questions regarding uh, the nuances of the dynamics of the monarch populations within Florida using these data in the future. Another project that we have ongoing in collaboration with the Department of Transportation in, in Florida is better understanding how non-traditional conservation lands affect the monarch positively or negatively. And so uh, we undertook a one-year study uh, funded by the Department of Transportation uh, to survey Florida roadways for two species of milkweeds, Asclepius humestrata and Asclepius uh, tuberosa, two of the more common spring milkweeds um, in Central and North Florida. And as you know, uh, Florida roadways are often rich in biodiversity. They harbor a lot of relic uh, herbaceous flowering plants, sedges and grasses. Uh, however, they are managed presumably by mowing uh, and the mowing frequency varies tremendously from one district to another and from one location to another. And mowing at the wrong time can be quite deleterious to um, the insects along the roadside and the available resources for those insect populations, including the monarch. So what we did is we took a section of North Central Florida from roughly Ocala to Jacksonville, west to Tallahassee, and we surveyed every FDOT roadway in, those, in that geographic space. Uh, we started out looking at uh, proximity uh, to appropriate habitat, namely pineland and sandhill populations, uh, or some pineland and sandhill habitat where you might uh, typically encounter these two species of <coughs> milkweed, excuse me. And then we um, uh, basically drove all these sections of roadside. And then once we found individual plants present, we got out of the road, uh, got out of the car, and we actually measured uh, the distance from one plant to another, counted individual plants, and also measured the distance from the edge of the road to the nearest plant in the road verge to get a better and full assessment of both the numbers of plants, the density, and overall the kind of the geographic composition of those plants within the road verge. And what we found is not surprisingly that uh, roadsides harbor a lot of milkweeds and have pretty robust populations. So over this one year uh, project, we surveyed almost 2000 kilometers of roadsides. We found about uh, 169 uh, distinct populations of Humestrata, about 29 distinct populations of tuberosa, over 22 counties. The plant densities range anywhere from one to well over 500 individuals. Um, and uh, that these encountered, uh, th that those plants encountered were either uh, a wide range from new recruits, new seedlings to well-established plants within the landscape. And more importantly through this, we, we, we provided FDOT detailed maps of where these populations occurred. So each of the blue highlighted roadways have high density populations of milkweed and those areas highlighted in red have ultra high density populations of milkweed. So if FDOT is looking for locations where they might want to alter their mowing frequency to benefit the milkweed populations and ultimately the monarch, these would be the low hanging fruit areas to target. And this is important because obviously this is an early season milkweed and mowing at the wrong time could not only uh, be directly deleterious to monarch butterflies using these plants, but it could also essentially uh, reduce the reproduction of those plants, cutting off flowers or developing seed pods. So the ultimate goal here will be to mow late enough in the year where there have been at least one generation of monarchs using these plants and ultimately late enough uh, after the fact when these plants have actually fully set seed and the seeds have dispersed. So these populations do not become ecological sinks, but they can grow over time in support of the monarch. And the other thing that we found based on this work is that the bulk of these milkweed populations occurred on the back slope of the roadside. And this is important because the great uh, bulk of the area that FDOT mows is the slope directly adjacent to the road, uh, the asphalt road itself. So uh, 
Uh, oftentimes, some of the back slopes don't get mowed or don't necessarily need to be mowed with the same frequency to enable uh, safety concerns or line of sight or available areas for cars to pull off in case of an emergency. So this adds additional credibility to the fact that FTOT could easily uh, manipulate or modify their uh, mowing frequencies in benefit of the milkweed populations and the monarch butterfly itself. And this is all good news because um, two years ago, the Department of Transportation in Florida entered into the National Candidate Conservation Agreement with assurances for the monarch butterfly. And this is a national agreement uh, for transportation and utility providers uh, entered into with the US Fish and Wildlife Service. And through this agreement, FDOT um, guarantees to provide or alter their management actions to benefit monarchs and monarch habitat. So they are committed to actually doing the right thing in support of monarch breeding habitat within Florida. And they're using the data that we provided them through this study to help identify locations where uh, they might be able to um, more effectively have an impact. The other thing we're working with DOT on starting this spring is we receive funding to uh, use the baseline data that we have uh, from those roadside surveys and now monitor these milkweed populations long-term within Florida using drones instead of individual boots on the ground. So we have a pilot study launching later this spring that will use drones and artificial intelligence to map out these milkweed populations and ultimately use those data to monitor these populations over time to see if they are decreasing, remaining stable or increasing in support of the Monarch CCAA with US Fish and Wildlife Service. So an opportunity to use cutting edge, cutting edge technology in support of Monarch conservation, a project that I think really is, is quite cool and I'm really looking forward to getting started. And then lastly, another project we have with DOT involves revegetation of areas managed by the Department of Transportation. So roadsides are often challenging spaces to work because there are a number of beautification or safety concerns. Uh, and there also is the proximity to moving vehicles, which can be uh, quite deleterious to insect populations. However, DOT manages retention basins adjacent to newly constructed roadways in Florida. These are both wet and dry basins. And so we have a multi-year pilot project funded by the Disney Conservation Fund and the Department of Transportation to revegetate both wet and dry basins in support of monarch and pollinator conservation. So we go into these locations and we plant areas around wet and dry basins with a diversity of blooming native herbaceous plants and two species of milkweed for the dry basins and two species of milkweeds for the wet basins. We go back and we monitor the success of plant establishment and ultimately use by the monarch uh, butterflies themselves. We go back and record the number of eggs and number of larvae utilizing these locations. And this has become a really uh, a highly productive and, and worthwhile project because there are essentially no restrictions in working in these retention basins compared to roadsides. Uh, and many of these areas are uh, quite extensive in size and they often border uh, natural landscapes as well. So we think this is a really good model of connecting individual locations like beads in a chain, helping promote available resources for monarchs for breeding, and also during the migration and supporting a wealth of other wildlife in the process. And as well, these become beautification projects for the Department of Transportation and for communities to enter into. And uh, it's just a lot of fun to get your hands dirty and go out there and plant thousands and thousands of plants in support of uh, wildlife. So we've had a, a blast with this project and we have really good evidence so far over three years that uh, these efforts are actually uh, generating a significant return on investment. And then um, some of the other work that we're doing involves uh, looking at best practices for um, urban and suburban green space. So there's been a lot of energy uh, around pollinator conservation in the monarch for the configuration and uh, use of green space, whether that be green roofs, urban parks and neighborhoods, uh, private uh, suburban yards, uh, to recoup some of this space uh, to make up for the extensive loss of um, breeding habitat 
and resources for pollinating insects and the monarch. But instead of just planting uh, plants willy nilly, you know, is there a sweet spot for the configuration of those plants uh, that generates more uh, impact for both attraction and um, kind of retention of that habitat? So we, uh, we entered into a project with the monarch looking at comparing monocultures of milkweeds to mixed species plantings that involve milkweeds and blooming plants to see if monarch butterflies encountering these, these landscapes would uh, utilize those differently or would be attracted to one of those over the other. And so what we found is that monarch butterflies did indeed prefer one type over another. In fact, they ch selectively chose uh, significantly uh, more frequently the mixed species plantings and laid more eggs in the mixed species plantings compared to the monoculture, which is a little bit surprising. <laughs> Excuse me. And also these mixed species plantings harbored many more beneficial insects, natural enemies, predators, than the monocultures. However, that um, the increase of uh, overposition and larval use of these uh, was not kind of outperformed the abundance of predators in these landscapes. So the bottom line is that they attract more species uh, of, of insects, beneficial insects. They attract monarch butterflies more frequently. More frequently, monarch butterflies lay more eggs in the mixed species plantings. And the proliferation of predators, uh, while abundant, was not deleterious to the monarch. So these mixed species plantings really outperformed in all cases the monocultures of native milkweed. So this gives a uh, kind of a best practice example of what you can do in either larger restorative areas in your own backyard or larger urban green space in support of the monarchs as well as other beneficial insects. And this is important because obviously this is the future of Florida, whether we like it or not, uh, that we're losing land, we're losing uh, habitat uh, rapidly, uh, it's becoming fragmented, it's becoming degraded, or it's strictly becoming lost. And you could argue that, well, this is a, a horrible picture, right? This is not the future of Florida that I want. I want a biodiverse, rich, future of Florida, but I don't want to kind of end on a, on a downside here. So I would say, well, this is an opportunity because what do each of these homes have? They have a landscape. And so the choices that we make within our landscapes, large and small, have impact. They have meaning and collectively they can help recoup the resources and the habitat for a wealth of other insects, especially, uh, especially butterflies and pollinating insects overall. And ultimately, our goal is to change that landscape and diversify it to something that looks a little bit more like this. And there's been a wealth of growing literature showing that just simple changes in these landscapes, diversifying them, adding additional resources of uh, floral abundance and floral diversity uh, will yield significant increases in insect richness, diversity, and abundance. However, again, just like that milkweed uh, issue I showed you just a few slides ago, you know, just adding diversity, is that enough to have an impact? Or is there a best practice for understanding how we configure these spaces and what plants we actually uh, incorporate into these landscapes? And so this is another study that we under <coughs> undertook several years ago that was funded by the Florida Wildflower Foundation that compared conventional Florida friendly and native yards and their attractiveness uh, for native uh, flower visiting insects. And so what we did is we uh, sampled 34 suburban yards over almost uh, two years. Uh, we also assessed the nearest uh, green space distance, the nearest green space size, the yard area, the plant richness, the plant type, the bloom abundance. So kind of as many metrics as we could capture within that landscape, we captured. And then we passively collected the insects that visited these landscapes. Um, and what we found ultimately is that it really does matter how you configure and kind of outfit your home landscape, that plant diversity and bloom abundance were big drivers of increasing the diversity and abundance of the pollinator insect community. However, that configuration of those plants really modulated that impact. So if you had a very even community of plants in your landscape, you had a significantly higher attraction value than just plant diversity and bloom abundance alone. 
And so as an example, a very uneven community would be a hundred plants, one of each of them being different species. A more even community would be 10 species that are represented by 10 individuals within a landscape. So ultimately what this means is that you have kind of a blueprint for making a difference in urban and suburban landscapes. So you can choose highly attractive, diverse plantings, but maximize the representation of those really good plants within your landscape. And your impact to attract butterflies and other pollinating insects will be higher than if you sort of took the kid in a candy store approach where you went to a store and or a nursery, you bought one of each type of plant that you liked and installed that in your landscape. So there is a best practice for kind of uh, developing a, a landscape plan that has maximum attractive value to any landscape. And so that's ultimately what we're trying to do within my lab is to better understand not only how to outfit landscapes, but is there kind of a sweet spot that maximizes the impact of landscapes large and small for that conservation value for insects. And then I, I wanna end just a little bit to talk about uh, tropical milkweed. So this is a, a kind of a contentious topic when it comes to the monarch, but I think we all know that tropical milkweed, of course, it's arguably the most widely available milkweed. There are very few kind of broad scale commercial alternatives. It has all the things that we like in a plant, especially people that have brown thumbs. It's colorful, it's easy to grow, and monarchs love them. But there is a lot of misconceptions about this plant. It's sold so widely that a lot of the public, as you know, when they go to a big box store and they buy that, or even a specialty nursery, many people often consider this a native. Of course, it's not a native. It's a non-native uh, plant to, to Florida and anywhere within the US. Uh, it's beneficial to Florida yards because it provides your own color. It does not senesce or die back like many other um, milkweeds, native milkweeds within Florida. Um, and there are other downsides in the fact that growers use a lot of pesticides to control pests on these plants because like other milkweeds, it's highly susceptible to uh, oleander aphids and a series of other pests. So that use of systemic pesticides is often critical for growers to have a plant that looks aesthetically pleasing for public, uh, for public sale. So we started a program that was funded by um, a University of Florida Sea Grant uh, to try to get at this issue because um, arguably the downside to using tropical milkweed is, is many. You know, obviously you go and buy a plant that has uh, been treated with systemic and you have monarch, monarchs laying eggs on it or larvae feeding on it, guess what, your larvae are gonna die. And we actually surveyed uh, Lowe's, Home Depot and Walmart stores in Florida where they got their milkweeds from, called the growers that supplied them, and then actually understood which chemicals were widely utilized, tried those in university uh, laboratory assays. And what we found is that of the common chemicals widely utilized in the production of tropical milkweed, almost all of them produced about 70 to 75% mortality with monarch larvae uh, feeding on them. It was even worse, however, if you went to a Lowe's, Home Depot, or Walmart store and you bought plants directly off the plant pallet when they were delivered to the store and you put monarch larvae on them, what we found in that situation was about 90 to 99% of those plants yielded uh, really high uh, larval mortality. So ultimately these plants, if bought commercially, it's kind of a dice roll. It's like playing the lottery. You do not know which plants are treated. If you end up with a treated plant, it's gonna be highly deleterious to the monarch larvae. It's gonna create an ecological sink for those monarchs, if you incorporate that plant immediately into your landscape without some of a, what of a waiting period until those chemicals disappear. Um, and of course, the other challenge with tropical milkweed is the fact that since it doesn't senesce, uh, monarch butterflies that encounter that, especially during migration, will fall out of migration and breed year round. And it's wonderful to have butterflies year round in Florida. Uh, however, if you're in central and north Florida and you have monarch butterflies feeding uh, or larvae feeding on your plants in January, February, or December, and a cold front comes through, which is what happened last week when it got down to 22 degrees in Gainesville, well, guess what's gonna happen? Your monarchs, your monarchs are gonna die. Those plants are gonna get killed and knocked back to the ground. So it's again, it's creating an ecological sink for the monarch butterflies and something that is 
really, um, unfortunately, quite dangerous to the monarch populations. So we wanted to hit this head on a little bit. So we received seed funding from the University of Florida to start a wildlife-friendly plant certification program. And this would kind of hit two different directions. It would look at the chemical inputs on the plant, as well as some data-driven assessment of those plants that are commercially available and ultimately provide a rating scale for what insects are attracted to those plants and ultimately enable us to compare one species of plant to another. So that if you eventually, if this was broadly adopted, went to a large commercial nursery and you saw that plant certification, you know two things. One is you know that it was friendly and available to um, insects or other wildlife from the time that you bought that plant and introduced it into your landscape. And secondly, if you were looking for which plants are attractive to birds, native bees, butterflies, this would enable you to compare plant to plant to buy the most specific plant for meeting the needs that you have as a home landscaper. And so uh, one of the elements, as I mentioned, is really looking at the chemical inputs. So as part of this effort, we're testing a wide range of different systemic and traditional insecticides for their toxicity to the monarch and ultimately trying to develop uh, the best practice so we can go back to growers and say, okay, if you use these concentrations or you use these chemicals uh, in your plant production, these are gonna be less harmful to the monarch. And by the time your plants reach the, um, the outlet store or the commercial nursery, they will essentially be less toxic and available and safe for utilization by the monarch from the point of sale of that individual plant. So again, we're trying to hit it on both ends from both the plant production side and the consumer side to ensure that when you go to a store, you have the most uh, confidence in buying a plant that is actually gonna be safe for the wildlife that you want to attract. And then we're also working with the Association of Zoos and Aquariums, and they started a program called Monarch Safe, which is saving animals from extinction. And this is a North American Monarch Initiative. And through this, excuse me, through this effort, uh, they're developing a series of toolkits available for zoos, aquariums, uh, other uh, entities, botanical gardens to utilize that help standardize messaging for the general public and help come up with kind of low hanging fruit uh, examples of things that individuals can do in support of the monarch that are data driven, uh, that are approved, and that we know will have a potential impact uh, for monarch conservation. And these include things like, you know, feeding the migration, ensuring that your landscape has uh, a diversity of blooming plants available for monarchs when they're migrating and ultimately enjoying monarchs in the wild instead of breeding them uh, in large numbers for release into the wild so that we keep those monarch butterflies safe and sound uh, and we ultimately ensure hopefully a future where monarch butterflies are rebounding and not declining. Um, and then I'm just gonna end by saying that if you're interested in resources for outreach and education, we have a number of different brochures. Many of these you've, I'm sure you've seen before. These are all available through the UF IFAS bookstore. Uh, <laughs> they're only a few cents a piece uh, and they're made for different uh, regions around the US, including uh, Florida and the Eastern United States. And then uh, hot off the presses, we just published this a week ago, and this is also available at IFAS Books. This is um, a coloring book aimed at families and children uh, called Keep Monarchs Safe, uh, and it tells the story of the remigration into the Deep South and into Florida, highlights the life history of the monarch and uh, Pinewoods milkweed. And so if you, again, are doing outreach, uh, you're looking to uh, have events sponsored by NABA, uh, hopefully you're interested in potentially uh, using these. And again, you can purchase these for $3.99 from the IFAS bookstore uh, on the University of Florida campus. Um, and then uh, one other thing I just wanted to mention, uh, many of you already know this, that we work with uh, First Magnitude Brewing in Gainesville and have over the years launched um, over 10 different uh, butterfly beers in support of butterfly conservation. And with each of those butterfly beers, we try to go above and beyond. And so this is our first uh, effort at reaching a national scale 
So this is based on kind of the same model as Black is Beautiful. And this campaign is called Restore the Reign of the Monarch. The butterfly beer is called Rain. Um, and ultimately we create the label and the recipe for the beer. And we get other breweries around the nation and North America to participate. And when they participate, they send back 25% of the proceeds from the sale of this beer that'll feed back into the University of Florida Foundation. And then we're working with the Xerxes Society for Invertebrate Conservation to take all that money and directly apply it to on the ground efforts to help restore monarch breeding habitat across North America. So if you are connected to breweries or you are interested, reach out to breweries near you and ask that they become part of this initiative. It's, uh, we think it'll be very popular and ultimately we have a little bit of planning time. This beer will be launched on a coordinated national scale uh, at the uh, end of September of 2022, right in the heart of the southward fall migration uh, next year, or this coming year. So uh, we are very excited about this and you can go to the University of Florida and the Florida Museum of Natural History uh, for more information about this initiative. And then lastly, just a, a pure um, self uh, uh, promotion here. As you know, I'm, I'm an author. I have a lot of books available. So these are just some of the books and other products that are available. But I just wanted to highlight the book on the far left-hand side. This is the second edition of Your Florida Guide to Butterfly Gardening, a much more revamped guide. It'll be available on April 19th through the University of Florida Bookstore. And if you're interested in buying that, you can go online and that discount code that you see below the picture there, that'll give you, I think, a 10 or 20% discount on a pre-order for this book. And so hopefully um, you might be interested in purchasing that uh, and supporting a, an author like myself. So with that, I'm gonna say thank you. Um, uh, it's really great to reconnect with all of you. And I wanna just thank uh, all our, our funders that have helped support these initiatives, uh, my lab, and, and last but not least, of course, all of you for really being the focus and kind of the backbone of butterfly conservation in South Florida and for helping with so many different initiatives to help keep these really rare species from falling off the face of the planet. So thank you so much. Dr. Daniels. Oh, yes. one, one, one second. Um, so uh, thank you, Dr. Daniels for your presentation. I just wanna let, let everybody know that this is being recorded. So if there were, um, some parts that you missed or you want to know more information about it, um, we will post this uh, on our website, the NABA of Miami Blue website, and also it will be on YouTube. So you can go back and find out about his books, um, the different initiatives, um, all the, the pamphlets and brochures and so forth. All right, so this is being recorded and will be posted later. All right, go ahead, Linda. Hi, Dr. Daniels. I was very sorry to read in the New York Times today that the uh, Naba Butterfly Refuge in South Texas has had to close its doors because it's being accused of trial, child sex trafficking. I presume that means that they're just closing it to guests, but I mean, obviously the butterflies can still come there, but I, I guess that's part of the, the monarch migration, that South Texas rep, Naba Refuge, isn't it? It is, yeah. They moved through um, extreme South Texas, and I feel really sorry for the 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 butterfly park getting getting caught in all these sort of crazy initiatives or crazy uh, conspiracy theories. And and so this is just a an artifact of the crazy times in which we live. And um, you know, Jeffrey Glassberg had a you know some really good quotes in that article talking about. Um, in the importance of that location and the, the many butterfly species that have been recorded over the years. So hopefully that this will, you know, soon pass us by and that will reopen to the public, but it's, um, it's just an artifact of um, the unprecedented times and sort of the, the ideologies uh, afoot today. So uh, it's just kind of caught in the middle. So it's a shame. Now, does the butterflies can still, of course, use that reef preserve? Of course, of course. Yeah, it's just close to the public. I mean, it's just a precautionary yeah. use for that reason. <laughs> Whoever and, uh, butterflies will become a target. Yeah, I mean, the, the, I mean, I guess you could also argue that, um, you know, the old saying that, you know, even bad news is good news or, or you know, it's, um, it's getting some attention, you know, albeit not the most... Um, 
in the way that that Jeff or others would want, but it still is getting a lot of attention. So it has raised um, awareness at least about that location. So hopefully that will spin off on uh, something on a positive once all this kind of um, quiets down, but it's a, it's a shame at the moment. Um, I do want what one second. Uh, one second. We I just want to highlight that we actually brought Mariana. Um, she was uh, she gave a presentation. So if you want to see her presentation regarding the butterfly center and all the butterflies that come through and you know what the workers do, um, you can actually uh, Adam posted it in the MiamiBlue.org website and it's also on YouTube. So you can kind of see what's going on. You know what they what they do. Yes. Um, Jay, it's yes. Barbara here. There's, I put some questions in chat and I'm not seeing the raised hand feature, but I see Susan's 11 Pro. She has her hand raised. So that would be a good way to do this. Okay. Susan. All right. So, oh, so all right. Yeah, yeah. I'm sorry, yeah. Jason. Hey, Jay, Jay, this, Jay, this is Dennis. Uh, oh, I'll oh, just, uh, just want to interject. That's uh, a wrench. Okay. It's a little late. Okay. Jay, the uh, I sit on the board of NABA, and I'll give uh, everyone a report later in this uh, meeting about sort of what's going on and what the board is seeing regarding the National Butterfly Center. All right, uh, we'll start with Susan. So Susan has her hand raised. You're muted, Susan. Yeah, I got it. Just got it. Well, hi all. Thank you so much for this. I'm so glad I saw it last minute on my uh, Instagram account. Uh, Jared, it's good to see you again. Susan Lerner here from um, Pan's Garden. Um, I was hoping to hear some real solid clarity about um, tropical milkweed, OE, and uh, you know, what do we tell people? Should they plant it? Should they pull it? Should they cut it? Should they burn it? You know, what, <laughs> what, what should we be doing with tropical milkweed, you know, Pan's Garden pulled it all out and you now have only uh, several species of native um, milkweed, but, you know, as an example, but there are people still, you know, who were, who were raising their butterflies in their little nets on their porches and so on and using tropical milkweed, not understanding why their chrysalises are turning black and soupy. So is there anything that, any prescriptions or you don't want to say? No, no, I think it's a great question and I apologize. I didn't uh, directly tackle that, that kind of uh, uh, issue. And so ultimately, you know, this is a convoluted issue that we have to address. So first and foremost, you know, we want to encourage people across Florida to plant native milkweed uh, first and foremost. That's, that should be the, the number one goal. We also want to work with the native plant community and, and other growers to, you know, develop additional ways and additional species that are available uh, eventually for, um, for sale into the market, because right now it's, it's really challenging to find, or for the bulk of the general public to easily find uh, tropic, uh, native milkweed um, in any abundance uh, and a, a diversity of species. So trying to hit it from both those sides, I think is, is really important. It's gonna take time. Um, from an OE perspective, there, there's no doubt that continuously breeding populations have higher incidence of OE. Um, but I, I still think that's less of a challenge with tropical milkweed than some of the other issues I mentioned, like the, the chemical use on that plant, especially systemic chemical use, that this is really a insidious uh, outcome that when people go and buy it, especially from a commercial nursery, they have no idea where these plants are treated. And if they're treated, uh, these chemicals can last within the tissues for many, many weeks. And so um, those plants would essentially be unusable by the monarch. And in, in trying to do something positive, they could actually be doing something quite negative to monarch populations. Um, and then, of course, the evidence uh, showing that migratory monarchs encountering this plant um, fall out of migration, become reproductively active and breed. And, and again, we should be discouraging any type of winter breeding uh, in Central and North Florida and all along the Gulf Coast. It gets a little more challenging in South Florida because we already have the non-migratory population. So what my recommendation would be, and it's incomplete, um, is that if you live south of Lake Okeechobee, 
it's okay to use tropical milkweed and it's okay not to cut it back. If you live north of Lake Okeechobee, theoretically you're in an area where butterflies should be migrating or at least encountering a environment in which they're less likely or they historically would be less likely to find a plant that has uh, vegetation year round or at least during the winter months. So trying to cut it back uh, around Halloween, north of Lake Okeechobee, forcing it to senesce, using native milkweed, working with growers to proliferate and make more widely available native milkweed, especially from seed sources. Um, and, you know, going to your, your nursery and saying, you know, why don't you carry these plants and trying to hit it from that side, but it's a bit of a chicken and the egg. And so it's a, it's an incomplete message, but that's the best we can do, I think at the moment. And we also do want to discourage people from raising large quantities of monarchs uh, for conservation, that this has been shown generally not to be beneficial or to have a, an impact and can actually lead to potentially uh, bad outcomes. So, you know, if you, if you rear that just to, to learn a little bit more about the ecology and life cycle, that's fine, but we really want to enjoy monarchs in the wild, not have them in captivity. Yeah, a lot of people say, well, you know, then the, then the um, predators are going to get them, et cetera, et cetera. It's just to, part I, of the natural world. I mean, we have to, we have to get past that, that uh, everything needs to be saved. And it's just part of, you know, having a, a living landscape that. Um, it would be, it would be great if there was some pronouncement by, by you guys about, about rearing butterflies and the way to do it and the way not to do it. That would really, you know, be very helpful in that because, you know, all these Facebook, Facebook groups, they're just like gung ho. And, you know, I know we still, we've tried to stay away from it a little bit because of that, because it's, it's, um, it's a very contentious issue, as you know. And so we've tried but, to hit it by just making recommendations. But if you, if, yeah, if we're not educating, who's going to, the, the other question is um, the native milkweeds and the growers, I mean, you seem to have some kind of, you know, or you, you have has some kind of, uh, relationship with the growers right and the growers are growing and spraying and doing whatever they're doing with the with the tropical can't we don't we have any any pressure or any incentive to have these people be growing um native milkweeds i mean they could do it on scale you know yeah, are it, they, it, yeah they are they are to, some are to some degree but again they they still are going to rely on some of the production methods which which often do use insecticides. And so, you know, ultimately we're trying to come up with um, kind of the best pollinator, you know, integrated plant and in integrated pest and pollinator uh, production methods that will reduce the quantity and potentially go to safer insecticides that could be used during production because we've, we've, we've done a lot of grower surveys. We've done a lot of public surveys as part of this certification plant program. And it's a non-starter with growers to not use insecticides. So we have to go to lower quantities, alternatives. Um, you know, what, what could we come up with as a, a compromise that would enable them to productively uh, generate the quantities needed at the similar cost, but yield plants that are safer for monarch use. That's, that's the end goal. And if that would apply then to tropical milkweed and all native milkweeds too, because they're gonna have some of the same constraints, whether it's native or non-native in production. It's just a, that this genus of plants is hit by a lot of pests, uh, particularly aphids, white flies. Uh, it's just a problem. Yeah. So we maybe have uh, about yep. five more minutes of questions. Um, right. So definitely utilize this time. But is there anybody else that would like to ask Dr. Daniel some questions? Real, and real quick, I have my hand up. <laughs> Uh, the gigant, um, the giant milkweed, not the native one. Um, oh, I have to look the name up again. Um, Calo Calotropics gigantea. <laughs> is that, has anyone tested um, how toxic that one is for monarchs? Because it will yeah, grow it, here. Yeah, they, they, they have. I don't remember off the top of my head where it stands kind of on the spectrum. Um, I don't have a lot of knowledge about um, the efficacy of use by monarchs. I know I, I have um, I have seen monarch larvae on them. Uh, in in my experience with that plant, queen larvae are utilize utilize them much more than monarchs. And again, from a purist point of view, I would argue that native milkweeds are are obviously going to be the best way to go. Um, 
Yeah, we and, just don't have them we, here, Jared. Oh, I understand. I understand, and that's that. You know, that's the problem is oh. that we do need to <laughs> proliferate. And I and I think South Florida is a is a different beast than the rest of Peninsula and North Florida, uh, and things can can be slightly different recommendation wise for South Florida, but. We, we ultimately want to have a standardization of those recommendations and the language of which we talk to the public about because a, a lot of what we have seen and, and the questions that we get, there's a lot of disconnect with the public on what to do. They, they don't know what to do. They're, they're getting bombarded with information overload, many of it inaccurate, many of it not data-driven, and they just don't know what to do. And I will also say that, uh, just as an aside, through that plant certification program, we also tested the, the influence of aphid infestation on overposition preference by the monarch and also larval survival and use by uh, monarch larvae. And what we found is the aphid load alone has significant impact on the selection and use by the monarch. Mm. It's not a surprise or it should not be a surprise for anybody that has seen those plants, but it's a direct causative factor to lower survival on those plants and lower selection by females to oviposit on those plants. So, you, you know, there's, there's a sweet spot in the middle. We need some aphid control, but too much is not gonna be good for the monarch. So we have to develop that, that kind of, what can we live with for pest control and monarch safety? And that's where we're trying to get with this project is what is that, what is that middle ground for recommendation to homeowners, you know, the general public and growers of how to control for pests and still have plants that are usable and safe for the monarch. Um, where is, is Lydia on the call? Is Lydia here? She's here. She's co-host. Lydia is with Connect to Protect. Mm -hmm. Jennifer's okay. here too. Oh yes, Jennifer's here. Connect to Protect, not the Connect uh, your um, septic tank. Yeah. Um, fair, fair child. <laughs> Yay, fair child. Hey, um, could you guys talk a little bit about what we kind of heard you're, you're working on, collecting native monarch seeds, I mean, um, milkweed seeds uh, from natural areas with permission and trying to grow them out to make them more available? Nobody wants to talk about Thanks, Barbara. it. Okay. Hey, I'm hey. here. <laughs> hey, everyone. Um, so in Miami-Dade County, um, through a grant that was funded by the Florida Native Plant Society, we um, worked on the conservation of our native milkweeds. So we sought to collect seeds and um, we propagated these plants from seed uh, and you know grew them at the nursery at Fairchild and tried to see what conditions they grew by best in, you know, with overhead irrigation daily, you know, just trying to find the, the right nursery conditions for them. So we have some research on that. And in general, this was just to make the milkweeds more available too, because um, us at Fairchild, we, we have a working relationship with the county. So we, re we have the permissions to collect the seeds con conser conservatively. So we also save some in the seed bank, you know, that are there for future use. And um, we were we were just studying studying the milkweeds and hopefully um, making them more available in the future is the next step that we have we have grown them now. All right, thank you, Lydia. Um, and we have time for maybe one more. We have time for one 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 more question. So, who would like to bring it home? Anybody else? I'll make a comment. All right, go ahead. Uh, regarding the giant milkweed, I have both the, I've tried with the native ones, but they die out very uh, quickly here. Uh, I have the tropical, of course, uh, and the giant milkweed. The monarchs use the giant milkweed much more than the tropical. Of course, the tropical gets eaten down very quickly. And uh, that has more of the uh, OE potential and the aphids. The aphids don't attack, attack the, uh, or affect the giant milkweed as much. So it's a little safer and uh, I do keep it trimmed. Likewise with the tropical, I do cut it back after the, the blooms and the, the leaves down. All right, thank you, Adam. Well, uh, this concludes uh, 
Well, this doesn't conclude the meeting, but um, thank you, Dr. Dams. That was really informative. Uh, you write a lot, so please support you know his books, get the pamphlets and stuff. Um, you can see that he's he's walking the talk, you know, where this turns into policy and stuff. So uh, or suggestions. So this is really good stuff. And please um, support UF, uh, support what they do with Monarchs. And this is just one of many butterflies that Dr. Daniels is working with. So, so he talked about the Monarch today, right? But you work with a lot of other uh, cool species. Th thanks so much, Jason. And thank you all for taking the time to hear me today. And I really appreciate again all, thanks to all of what you do in South Florida for of all the wide range of different species that really do need our help. So thank you so much. Right, thank you. Thanks. Thank you, Dr. Daniels. All right, next up, um, we are going to do the, so um, I believe uh, Linda and Dennis, we're gonna do this all together, but we have the nominations of committee officers. We have our elections. So uh, Dennis can, are you here? Dennis and Linda. Yeah, uh, so uh -huh. I'll recognize Linda uh, Evans, who can uh, give the uh, slate of nominations for the, the, uh, the organization, something we're required by the bylaws to do every year. And uh, so a little difficult via Zoom. Uh, I'll turn it over to Linda to give the slate of uh, recommended officers. Um, on that list that you have uh, posted there, uh, Jay, I made a mistake when I sent it to you. The membership chair is no longer Patty Ferry's. Mary Jackson has uh, agreed to take that over. But this is a, a slate of the uh, nominated uh, members of Miami Blue for the uh, next term, so um, we should be voting on this slate today. Any questions? Any any uh, nominations from the floor? Uh, just drop the S from my last name, please. <laughs> Good job, Jay. There's, there's only one of me. <laughs> I guess, Jason, we need to vote. Yeah, so uh, okay. that's going to be a little difficult. I guess the question is, is there any, are there any other nominations that people would like to um, uh, make in terms of these various uh, uh, positions for the Miami Blue chapter? If you have got any, if you have any other uh, nominations, raise your hand. I don't see any, although I'm not looking at the full screen. Do you see any, uh, Jay? Uh, 